So, welcome to session um, G4, which is one of our leadership-themed sessions. And um, what we've got is we've got, um, I think we're going to have two excellent halves to this session. Okay? We have a first half from the USA, and we have a um, second half from the Netherlands. And so what we're going to do, we're going to actually run this as two, um, as, as, uh, as two sessions. So in a sense, what will happen is, first of all, um, Elizabeth is going to um, have the first 45 minutes um, talking about nurse leadership development to improve um, quality. And then we are going to seamlessly hand over to Marianne and, and Jan um, to talk about their experience on leadership and empowerment of change in healthcare. And my job is to keep everybody to order keep us all to time <laughs> and, uh, and to run round with the, the microphone. So we're here together between now um, and, and 12 o'clock and I think this is going to be a fantastic session. So I'm not going to spend ages introducing speakers because it takes away from the time of the content, which I think is more important. So um, Elizabeth, introduce Thank yourself you. and over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Elizabeth Brown and um, I am based in Boston at uh, the Partners Healthcare System. And I would like to first uh, thank IHI and BMJ for inviting me here today. It's really nice to be with you. The Partners Healthcare System is uh, one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard Medical Center, the Mass General, the Brigham and Women's. Um, I have been very fortunate over maybe the last 10 years to work with many of the hospitals in the community, particularly the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, which this project is partnered with, and other the nursing communities to work with nurses in other countries in sharing some best practice around quality and leadership. You know, it's, it's interesting, as I've listened to some of the speakers this week, as well as I reflect on my own, you know, last five years, I thought to myself, I never thought I would be here. I didn't think my journey wasn't to set out and do this and come and share this with you. It just happened. And it's interesting, as I listened to Atul Gawande the other day say, if you asked me a couple of years ago, it's not as if I would say, wow, we got to go and get a checklist. But as the evidence came together, it just made sense. And I think around the work that we've been doing, it just makes sense. If you're going to start some very deep, wonderful uh, quality work. It makes complete sense that you harvest and engage the nurses at the front line. And in order to do that, they may want some tools to help them um, present or manage or message that story or work with their patients or their staff. Also, if you're bringing in new nurse, whether it's a new charge nurse, a nurse manager, a ward sister, uh, a ward matron. I know we have different terms for the actual person who's the nurse manager running the actual unit operations. If you're bringing that person in new and you're providing them with some leadership content, it makes complete sense to do that in an action learning environment and doing it around quality and safety. So the two of them make complete sense. And so, um, over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to have an opportunity to share some of the um, work that happened in Boston, in Turkey, and also in um, India around nursing leadership development and quality improvement. You know, I was struck with uh, when Maureen gave the keynote, and she said, you know, we've been talking with organizations on do they do strategy from the outside in or the inside out. And I think each of these organizations did a little bit of both. They did a very purposeful, a very intentful piece of work around nursing and leadership. So in that sense, it was from the inside out. Yet they were reacting to a lot of the forces that were was going on in the environment. So in that sense, it was from the outside in. And so let me take a little bit of time and share their journey I'll give you three cases. We'll talk about the leadership development model that they used and how they customized it, each of them in a different site. Um, I'll talk about a little bit around managing performance since this is a quality conference. So that particular competency and how they developed some unit-based dashboards in order to do some quality improvement work um, on their units. 
Now the Beth Israel Deaconess, that's the first place we'll start in Boston. It's a very large teaching hospital, over 600 beds, 6,000 employees, um, level one trauma, very, very busy. It's in the Longwood area where there's many, many hospitals near Harvard Medical School. Their journey of, of really focusing on nursing leadership development happened after the two hospitals merged. It was really an environment of chaos um, after two hospitals came together. And you can see, because of this picture, the, the, the um, medical center is actually physically located on two different campuses. And so after that, there was a lot of instability in nursing leadership. And it was resulting in some turnover in the nursing staff. There's a lot of financial pressure on the hospitals to improve their financial bottom line. It was a time in the United States when transparency was becoming very big. Is that better? Can everyone hear? OK, sorry about that. Um, and so they decided this was an opportunity to really focus on um, nurse leaders in order to drive some of the quality agenda. Now I'm going to take a step back and tell you about a little background on the second case. This is based in Turkey. This is the Acabadem healthcare system. It's a growing private healthcare system. And we got engaged in some work maybe about five years ago when they were building a new um, oncology center. They wanted to do a, understand a little bit more about multidisciplinary care, the role of the oncology nurse, safety around chemotherapy. So I was over in Istanbul and we were on this workshop and as nurses do, you sit down, you have a cup of coffee and I sat down with the chief nursing officer and she said, you know, there's one thing that I'm struggling with. She said, it's both an opportunity and a challenge for me. She said, we have a very, very young workforce. We ta and Maureen talked about the youth bulge. Very much in Turkey, there is a youth bulge. And she said, we have brand new charge nurses. They've only been in practice for a couple of years. They don't, they don't have a lot of clinical background, but I quickly am moving them into leadership roles because our system is growing and the need is there, but I don't feel like I'm preparing them well. Um, do you know of any training programs? And I said, well, you know, training might not have a lot of impact. Maybe we could think about some ideas on actually development. Um, so that was the beginning of their piece of work. The third case that we're going to talk about today is um, based out of India. And I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to go to this session by Dr. Sibal and Puri this week on lessons from India. It was very enlightening. It, was, it really was a nice session. But India's healthcare system is really, really growing. Um, and so this system, the Wokart system, um, is developing many new hospitals. And I was over there a few years ago talking with um, some of the team. We were doing some quality improvement work. And I just happened to have a conversation with the VP of Human Resources. And he had recently joined. He came from information technology was his background. He said, you know, um, in, in IT, we have a career path. You know, we had opportunities to promote people. And I, I'm not seeing that so much in the hospital system. He said, I, I'd really like to help develop some systems to develop the nurses from within. He said, we have a shortage of nurse leaders, and I have a wonderful group of nurse leaders. I'd like to help develop them so they could take on new roles, maybe open new hospitals, really see that over a period of time they could have a career trajectory with us. So I said, well, interestingly enough, we started doing some development work in Boston, in Turkey. Maybe some of the learnings from those we could apply here. So that's what each of these organizations did. Each of them, because of what was going on in their environment, decided that they wanted to leverage the role of the nurse manager, the charge nurse, the nurse matron, or the nurse supervisor, 
I wanted to leverage that role because they realized it was so key. It's one of the most important roles in the hospital because you're so close to what's happening at with the patient, but yet you have to translate what's coming from the board, from your leadership group. You have to message that up and down. People are calling this role the chief quality officer of the unit. It's a microsystem. It's a little system that you're running. People also call this role now the chief retention officer because you have such influence on your staff. So they wanted to really leverage and work on this role. And so each of them customized a leadership development program based on a set of competencies that they got out of their literature and designed for their system and applied it to projects. Now this is the initial competency model that came out of Beth Israel Deaconess. It looks so simple. You say, okay, there's nothing new here. But what I think was important here is they spent so much time looking at the knowledge, skills, and behavior that go behind these competencies. They had focus groups with nurse managers, with physicians, with staff nurses. They combed the literature for um, best practice in nursing leadership as well as leadership models from outside of healthcare industry. And they really begin to put this model in place of what were the expectations for a nurse manager at this hospital in 2005, 2006, 2010, what was most appropriate? What do we expect from you? And so it was a, it was a collaborative process of building this model. Now this work was done during the time that um, AONE, which is the American Organization of Nurse Executives, they were designing a model. So there's models that are out there that you can at least begin to look at and then customize to your needs. And that's exactly what happened. You know, the other day, Dr. Uh, Puri said in the India session, think global, go local. And I think that's what happened uh, as we took some of the best practice. We didn't just plop it down in other countries. We began to say, what's applicable, what's not applicable? This is just a photo of some of the nurses doing affinity cert, um, sort. They wrote down on, on little um, 3M <coughs> stickies all the tasks that they do every day. And we began to put them on boards and then sort them. Where are you spending most of your time? Where do you want to be spending most of your time? Where does your leadership think you're spending most of the time? So we really began to try to customize this competency model to fit for them. Some things were appropriate, some weren't. In Turkey, they went off and interviewed every single one of the nurse managers across the system. Again, that was a multi-hospital system. Same with India, multi-hospital system. So they began to get feedback from physicians, nurses, um, other people in the hospital. What do you think is most appropriate for this role in order to manage the unit and drive quality improvement projects? So for example, one of the competencies is building collaborative relationships. Here are some of the expectations that the nurses and the team said we think is important if we are actually practicing this competency as a nurse leader. These are some of the um, knowledge, skills, behaviors that is expected of us. The ones that are red are the ones that the different countries changed. So for instance, the bottom one says, you know, it, it's an expectation that as a nurse leader, you'll partner with your physician leader to achieve results. Maybe you're gonna work together on decreasing ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, in working with the nurses in Istanbul, they thought they were really had some strength in their um, relationships with the physicians, where they wanted to work with some of the other support departments. So for them, they wanted to make it very explicit that the partnerships were more multidisciplinary. Instead of going through every single one of the programs, what I'm gonna do is share with you some of the common elements that each one of the programs did, whether it was in Boston or Turkey or India. One thing I think was really important is that it was a partnership with nursing, human resources, and quality. So the three of them had representation that got together to design the curriculum, write some of the cases, actually teach it. And so I think that gave strength 
to the work because it was a collaboration. You know, sometimes the nurses are saying, well, the quality department's down there. I'm not sure what they're doing, and sometimes the quality department saying, I'm not sure why the nurses aren't doing this. So sometimes uh, inadvertently they didn't realize that there were different expectations and they weren't necessarily aligned. And our human resource colleagues have some wonderful skills in training and development, and by bringing together, I think we learned a lot from each other. This program was over a period of time. Um, the one that started with Beth Israel was over 18 months. I think we've all agreed that that was too long. But the point is that the nurses would come together for maybe three or four days at a time, intensive work where they would bring their projects, would infuse some content and some exercises. They would go back to their units and do work and then come back again. And so you were reinforcing the competencies over time, but you maybe were only focusing on two of them on a deep dive when they got together. So it was over a period of time. I told you it was competency-based, highly experiential, lots of cases that were written by the nurses um, or the teams who wrote them locally of what was going on, um, as well as cases that are in the literature. You know, you can buy copyright permission to use many cases, um, and there's some really good ones out of um, Harvard Business Review, some of them specifically on nursing, um, as well as in hospitals. So we used a lot of the cases. Um, some other common things were just the celebration of milestones to really highlight, you know, when I was in India, there was um, some nurses who were not actually proficient in speaking either in Hindi or English because they were speaking in the local dialect in their community hospital. And for them to come and present in front of their colleagues on a project, for that was a huge milestone that started building some confidence. Um, and celebration, you know, they did some wonderful, wonderful things um, just, just to celebrate each other. Another thing that was interesting that, I, not until I look back do I realize that it was a good thing to do for them, was this branding. They called it something, not that it was like this big initiative over here. It was just they branded it. So the first one, SAGE, that stood for Strategies of Accelerated Growth and Excellence. And a sage is someone who's a wise person. It's also a, a, a her, an herb. And so for them, this really struck, um, stuck. Um, the third one, NLP, very simple, Nursing Leadership Program. It's branded. You go around and anyone will say, I went through NLP 1. I went through NLP 2. Or they'll say, you know, we want to set up this committee. I think the chair should be someone who went through NLP. You know, so it's really funny how it just kind of stuck this brand. Um, in each of them. Um, the other day I went to a presentation on uh, young doctors. It's very good, a group out of um, the UK. And, and they said, you know, when the doctors are coming out into the units for the first time, they did a project on quality improvement, giving them projects, giving them tools. And, and the presenter said one of the things that was most successful is we just gave them some tools, some frameworks to begin to think a little bit differently because maybe they didn't have that. Um, those frameworks in their training in medical school. And I think what was ended up being more powerful than I realized is that there were a few models that we used consistently that the nurses begin to really understand and, and frame their approach to quality, their approach to leadership development. This particular model is out of the Center for Creative Leadership, has some wonderful, wonderful work. It's so simple when you think about it. It says that in order for leaders to grow, you need three things, and they need to be in balance. You need to have a challenge, and that makes sense. If we go to our job every single day and it's the same and we don't have something that pushes us, you know, we might be satisfied, but we may not be able to grow. The second is you need an element of assessment. You have to know where you stand in this challenge. We talk about our blind sides. Not, we don't know what we don't know. This is an opportunity to explicitly say, I'm taking on a new challenge. How do I think I'm going to do? And it gives you the language or the permission to have that conversation with your supervisor. This is something brand new here for me. Or you know what, I'm pretty good at this. I actually could mentor someone on this. 
The third element is support. It's really about aligning the support. It's what we say, let's set people up for success. You know, if you have challenge and you have assessed and you know you're not going to be perfect at it, but you have no support, you may succeed. It's kind of like those times when you say, just jump off and swim. You can do it. Go do it. You may succeed, but you may not grow. So you may not take that learning and apply it in another situation because you don't even want to think of that time. You stayed up all night. You were so stressed. You got through it. So this is trying to say, you know, you need support. So we use this model to design the curriculum for the nurses to talk about their leadership development as well as for them to have conversations with the rest of their staff. So what were some elements of challenge that we tried to design into the curriculum as well as for them to think about their growth? Um, some of them I already talked about, that they were very exper experiential work. You were actually doing a project on your unit, and you it was a challenge. You brought it and discussed it. Another one was about writing narratives, really trying to journal and talk about the work that you were doing. The last one, commitment, you had to show up. In the beginning, some of the nurses weren't coming to the sessions because they couldn't leave their units. The unit was so chaotic or busy that they couldn't leave. And you know, we started having conversations about developing the second line of people. If you aren't able to step away for your unit, then maybe there's something you want to think about. So even for some people, that was a challenge. We talked about um, an element of assessment. In each of the competencies, people sat down and did a self-assessment, you know, sort of their own reflection. Am I a novice at this? Am I maybe advanced on this? We use Benner's uh, work, a novice to expert, to help them go through each of the elements of that were hidden behind all the competencies. The Beth Israel Deaconess did a 360 where they actually did assessment from superiors and peers as well as staff. The other hospitals didn't quite feel they were ready for that. One of the competencies was managing self, and within that, everyone did a Myers-Briggs um, personality. And that actually, in evaluation, Across the board, all the nurses in every country thought this was a wonderful piece of work because they were able to get a sense of how they take in information and how they like to work, but they also got a sense of how their colleagues maybe take in information in work. Support, we talked about that, the importance of having support. Some of the ones that were built in here were peer groups, journaling, coaches, one-on-one um, -on -one feedback sessions, people that had gone through the course the year before being assigned now to mentor a new person. Content was available. They had you know websites set up, email groups set up. So I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive over the, the rest of our session on the one competency around managing performance, since this is um, a lot related to quality. So the competency of managing performance. Some of the behaviors or skills um, under this are develop and implement a dashboard, measure and ensure optimal unit performance, practice continuous quality improvement, manages financial and material resources, and able to anticipate and implement change in your unit operations. So those were some of the behaviors that were expected under this competency for the nurse manager. They're a little bit different. In, in the United States, the nurse manager does have a larger scope of financial responsibility. That was a developing com competency in Turkey. The nurses yet weren't doing their budgeting. Um, so this particular piece wasn't as strong for them. But where all three of them wanted to focus on was the top one, develop unit-based dashboards. Because they were starting to do their own projects and they wanted to know how they were doing in these projects. And there was a growing expectation of looking at some indicators of health of your unit. What were the appropriate indicators you wanted to look at, whether they're related to um, the performance around human resources or around quality. So we really spent some time on developing some dashboards. In the beginning, the nurses 
said, where do I begin? Now they're further along and they have a lot of their dashboards in. But in the beginning, I said, how do I develop a dashboard? And a dashboard, for those of you maybe who aren't familiar with that term, is if you're a pilot or you're driving a car, when you look at the screen, there's a set of parameters. That in the United States, we call that a dashboard, where you can see how fast you're going, how much gas you have, how much mileage you have. It's a quick snapshot of how well you're doing. And that's the concept behind this tool. It's just a tool to say this is a quick snapshot on how I think my performance of my unit is doing. So the nurses began to um, build these. Uh, one way is they looked at some root cause analysis to say, well, what are some areas that I know I'm struggling with? Medication safety, perhaps, maybe falls. We began to do a lot of work on nursing sensitive indicators. Um, in the U.S., many of us are, um, we have to present our data to a national data set that looks at nursing sensitive indicators. In other countries, this was new and we spent more time around designing those. Um, we also talked with them, well, how do you find sources of guidance to help you find what are the most appropriate indicators for your unit, for your hospital, across hospitals? These were a few that we used. You know, yesterday I went to a wonderful presentation, um, some nurses out of Wales, and they talked about the Thousand Life um, campaign. And, you know, some of the indicators that started in the U.S. started out of the 1,000 Life campaign. Um, NABH is the Indian um, accrediting body. And so these were just some places to say, okay, well, all right, the ANA publishes the evidence behind a nursing sensitive indicators. A lot of this is in the public domain. You can download. And so we began to look at the ones that made most sense for each unit. The international patient safety goals, many hospitals were doing this as a strategic initiative, and so the nurses were beginning to pulling back on the understanding, well, what does that mean for my unit? So maybe the nurses in the OR, they all got together and said, let's develop our dashboard and start looking at the universal protocol. Um, other nurses on the medical surgical floor said, you know, we really want to look at pressure ulcers. This is a very busy slide, and I'm happy to share it with anyone. The intent is not to review this whole slide. The intent is to show you that um, sometimes we had to take a step back and do a lot of work in understanding what is an indicator. What are the most appropriate? Is this a structure indicator I want to look at? Is it a process indicator? Or is it an outcome indicator? And that was a really, really nice exercise because it began to have the nurses get together to, to have a, a portfolio of indicators they wanted to look at and make the connection um, of structure and process to outcome. So this actually were some workshops. Nurses, sometimes you'd get a whole hospital together, or sometimes you'd get all the ICU nurse managers together. We did different exercise to come up with the right set for that group at that time. We had some workshops. Okay, you want to collect that, but how are you going to do it? We had to roll up our sleeves. Who's going to do it? Who's responsible? How are you going to get it? Some hospitals have this online. Other hospitals, it's paper. Other, it's people walking around collecting. This is one from Beth Israel Deaconess. Very early on, rudimentary, very simple. You, it's not a great photo, but basically, they're looking at nursing assessments, hand hygiene, patient identification. And yesterday, I saw a wonderful presentation where a group had this thing, the safety cross, which was about just putting up on the unit how many pressure ulcers. And just putting something up visually kind of motivates people to say, wait a second, I, I want to do better than that. And it also helps the staff. They are much more informed now. They're, they're doing this work. They're collecting it. They, they own it. Um, versus something else that the tool that senior management is looking at. This is theirs. They've become a little bit more sophisticated. Again, a very busy slide. Um, but it began what once they started collecting various um, indicators. The top ones are around improving the patient experience. The next ones are around reducing harm, pain. And the last one about re reliable test results. 
They began to put in the ones that were most important. Some of them are structure, some are process, and some are outcome. The colors mean green, you've reached your goal. Because they started setting targets. The uh, yellow means, you know, you're trending towards your goal, you're going up, but you're still not at your goal. And red means you're trending down from your goal. And so this began to, for the nurses then to have a piece of information and, and talk with their staff about it. And as you, if you have green up there all the time, well, maybe you retire that and put something else up. <coughs> I think what was happening now was this balancing act between what was happening centrally and what was happening locally. This was a really ground up effort um, for some of the hospitals. And so what you really try to do is now balance what you're happening at the unit. So for instance, I remember having a conversation with one of the nurses around infection and she said, oh no, I don't have to worry about that. Infection control nurse comes over, she writes some stuff down, she brings it back to the committee and they look at it. I said, well, don't you want to know that? Don't you want that on your dashboard, what the infection rates are on your floor? And she said, yes. So you said, okay, let's try to balance what's central, what's local. Now the whole reason for all of these obviously is to drive quality initiatives. It's just a tool to look at data, but what you when you begin to do the plan do, check act, you know, cycle, you really want to make sure you have the data. So the, the dashboard was a nice tool, but actually doing the work was really the most important piece. So there were just some wonderful quality improvement projects that all of the nurses brought throughout the leadership work. Um, I won't go through all of these, I'll just share a few of them. Um, customer delight is really patient satisfaction in India. Many of the nurses worked on uh, the patient's uh, sort of satisfaction with nursing care. Discharge time was a big one, it seemed universally across, so many of them worked on efficiency measures. Um, and the bottom two, pressure ulcer and pain management was some nice work that some nurses in India did that they actually presented in a conference. One of the goals for Beth Israel Deaconess was eliminating VAP. And their goal was 100% compliance to the bundle. And that's a process measure that nurses can look at is compliance to the bundle. Where is the ventilate associated pneumonia, certainly it's an outcome that you don't want and you can partner with your physician team, but nurses have a little bit more influence. And so we tried to have them look at indicators that were a little bit more within their sphere of influence. So they looked at compliance to the bundle. This is some nice work that the nurses at Beth Israel did. You can see in 2006 where they started their initial unit-based championship work where they were at 70%, and through the course of two years, they now have reached close to 100% compliance in all their ICUs to the Ventilay Associated Bundle. Um, you will see a similar slide that shows a decrease in Ventilay Associated Pneumonia. So, as I wrap up, some of the outcomes that came out of this is that um, the groups, as they started this leadership work, they actually ended up having a product. They had a program where if the faculty learned it, they could go and train a new set of nurses going forward. And that was actually an unexpected outcome. We had some, did some train the trainer. Um, Unit-based projects, we talked about that. Um, another thing that was happening was accreditation. During this leadership work, many of the hospitals were going through accreditation, um, both Joint Commission as well, as well as the national ones. And what was nice about this is that the nurses had some projects already set in around accreditation, but now they had some tools to begin to lead the projects, to present the projects. Um, and so they probably, maybe they would have got accreditation without this work, but it was really nice partnership of quality and leadership work. Um, another thing was this idea of spread. I sort of call it, you know, the hidden curriculum, things that you don't necessarily intentionally do, but then happen. There was wonderful spread across the systems of because you had these learning groups, people were taking best practice from one group to another. They weren't reinventing the wheel. So they were meeting regularly, and maybe they were meeting around their work, 
but subsequently they were talking about other issues. And so you began to see a lot more um, sharing of information and a little bit more standardization that w was happening. I think another thing that ended up happening um, was the development of a second line of employees. You know, I, when I was in um, India, I took this picture and I was in a park and I read below it, it said, this is the banyan tree. So I, I took that picture because a couple of weeks earlier, um, one of the physicians had talked with the nurses and he was someone that was really highly respected by everyone. He just had a leadership style that was so authentic. And he said, you know, I'm so excited you're here in this program. We believe in you. You, you're, you are the strength. You're bringing everything to our patients. He said, but I, I, wanna, I want you to reflect on something. He said, it's not all about you. He said, don't be like the banyan tree. He said, the banyan tree is so big it doesn't let any light underneath it, and nothing can grow. He said, I think a measure of success will be the amount of people on your team that grow, that take on new roles, that are out there doing the presenting. And I think that ended up being one of the most powerful things of this, and the things that the, when the nurses talk about going through this program, some of the things that they feel um, is the most success. They felt like they had more tools to have those conversations with their staff of what's most important to you. Um, so that ended up being a, a nice, I think, um, part of the hidden curriculum, I guess. And then finally, I think um, many of them went on and took on some great new roles. Um, this one down here is showing one of the first nurse leaders that went through, now running last week, a big lean exercise across the entire system. And so she really has taken on some amazing um, bigger roles within the whole system. Over here is a nurse manager um, who started, who, who was quite timid, and now she's running uh, one of the hospitals as a chief nursing officer. And then many of the nurses, again, in India, we talk about the wonderful component of celebration. The one in the middle is um, leading the whole quality um, initiative for the whole system. So it was really nice to see some of them even go on and take on new roles, but many of them didn't. You know, they really stayed and managed the micro system, but they had a much better sense of how it fit in the macro system. So th thank you so much for letting me share this. I'll, if we have time, I'll take some questions. If not, I'm happy to spend time with you afterwards. Um, we've literally, um, Elizabeth, got three minutes um, left. So um, we can maybe take a couple of burning ones, but I think it would be great if you could kind of hang around at the end, because I think there were quite a lot of um, specific things that people wanted to ask you about. So, so if we kind of like, if, if you're happy to commit to stay, and then people can come and... Um, Yeah. The great thing, by the way, is because we've all paid to come to the forum, we all get all the slides from all the sessions, um, and, and they'll be available shortly to download, so we'll be able to get all of those slides. Um, can, can I just say, Elizabeth, I mean, I thought that was, that was terrific. Um, I, mean, I think there was so much kind of, you know, um, rich learning in that. And, and like, one of the things for me is, you know, if we want people to change and we want people to grow, we need to involve them in the change, you know, in a sense that, that too often, I think, we impose somebody else's leadership structure or system and actually, if we involve people from the beginning, it just makes it so much quicker as we go along. So that was terrific. So can we thank Elizabeth? Okay. Um, we're just going to take a minute or two to just swap over now. So why don't you have a conversation with the person next to you about um, just what that was like for you and what you found about that. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes while we, um, while we load up Jan and Marianne. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. And that's me.
Sure, no problem. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so um, swiftly on to the, the second half of our session, and we, we have our second case study now from, from the Netherlands, and again, just kind of carrying on um, a little bit with the, um, you know, one of the themes that we saw from Elizabeth's presentation, you know, we might be, um, you know, having specific challenges in specific countries, um, but actually, a lot of the answers are the same. So I think it will be very interesting when we, when we hear Marianne and Jan to think about you know, what are some of the differences and what are some of the, the similarities to the approach that Elizabeth showed us. So, um, Marianne, over to you. Thank you, Helen, for the introduction. I'm Marianne de Visser. I'm based uh, here in Amsterdam at the Academic uh, Medical Centre. Um, it is uh, one of the hospitals uh, in Amsterdam, but one of the eight university hospitals in the, in the Netherlands. I'm a neurologist and I also have uh, management responsibilities. Um, I'm chair uh, of the, uh, one of the ten divisions um, in the Academic Medical Center, which I will abbreviate to AMC. Uh, it's a privilege really to be here and I should like to share um, some experiences with you on the instrument of uh, internal auditing, which was introduced in the AMC in 2003. The leadership of the uh, AMC um, uh, realized about a decade ago that there were myriad quality improvement initiatives uh, across the hospital. However, whether the quality of care really improved was rather dubious and therefore the governing board decided to develop an internal auditing uh, system together with and for medical specialists and nursing staff to provide insight uh, in the effectiveness of medical and nursing tasks, duties and responsibilities as well as the organization of patient care with the ultimate goal, obviously, to improve the quality of that care. The agenda for this talk is as listed um, on this slide. With regard to the uh, first goal, uh, I should like to refer to a paper by Mark Edwards, the president and CEO, of uh, a quality assurance to quality improvement consulting, who is also a researcher on this topic. And he obviously advocates that peer review should replace the traditional quality assurance model. He is convinced that uh, medical and uh, nursing profession uh, should be able to demonstrate that the self-regulating activity is effective, not only at protecting the public from uh, gross outlier behavior, but also in terms of a vital contribution to the quality and safety of care. Quality assurance, Edward says, is usually narrowly focused on detecting grossly um, substandard care, on weeding out the bad apples, which makes it unnecessarily um, threatening to the vast majority of the otherwise competent physicians and nurses. By focusing on the cutoff point of substandard care, uh, the quality assurance model loses the ability to uh, address marginal practice and to influence um, overall group performance. Um, further goals, as you can see, is to boost uh, accountability through uh, measuring elements of patient care and uh, transparency uh, of the medical practice. And that uh, is done by uh, um, pointing um, to the leadership role of the chairs of the clinical departments. The internal auditing focuses on different groups of professionals. First and foremost, uh, on the chairs of the department since they are expect uh, to, are expected to show leadership and should lead the way to improving patient care by using the recommendations 
uh, of the audit report. And secondly, the doctors and uh, uh, nurses who play a crucial role in uh, re the reali realization of the recommendations uh, of the audit report and in general on the department's goal and therefore also in the audit. And lastly, the members of the auditing team because peer review is a learning experience not only by the auditees but also by the auditors. In um, my hospital, the AMC, the clinical departments are clustered together in so-called divisions and those divisions uh, are led by uh, a uh, manager, nurse manager and by um, a, a medical specialist, usually uh, a, a chair of the de department. And these two are supported by a, a manager uh, with the purpose to support the board of directors, the governing board, in maintaining the span of control. In the Netherlands, the department chair is legally responsible for the quality of patient care. They are what you could call uh, the owners. And therefore, the audit and the uh, audit report are primarily aimed uh, at the department chair and the department medical staff. The position of the department uh, chair is rather awkward, sometimes very difficult, because on the one hand, he or she is um, what we call the primus inter pares, the first among equals, uh, his or her peers. However, in a huge organization like a university hospital, the chair also has management duties and responsibilities, like uh, including the reduction of cost of patient care, uh, uh, improving the efficiency of patient care, and so forth and so on. And those uh, tasks and responsibilities are sometimes opposite to the medical responsibilities and aspirations. Um, the uh, internal audit focuses on um, quality and safety of patient care uh, and the different parts of that are listed here uh, on the slide, Act effectivity and safety, the organization, and um, on the outcomes. When the um, auditing system was developed, there were a few prerequisites. As internal auditing is primarily an instrument for self-regulation with uh, professional ownership entirely in the hands of uh, the medical specialist and the nursing staffs, the topics addressed uh, have to be relevant um, and have to be uh, interesting in order to ask these professionals to devote their precious time and energy into uh, an audit. Uh, the logistics, the, sorry, the, the, um, the topics must also be in line with matters um, for which doctors and nurses are actually responsible and for which they have the author authority uh, to make changes. It what would not make any sense to ask them to address parking facilities on the AMC uh, premises, would it? Um, the audits have to be efficient. Um, efficiently facilitated um, so that the professionals uh, can just do their thing. Um, the audit team's assessment um, will have um, to use as much as possible um, clearly defined and uncontested data. In current AMC um, uh, internal audits, this assessment is partly based on documents and facts and partly on the impressions and shared experiences of the audit uh, team. There are obviously national uh, performance indicators uh, issued by our inspectorate of uh, health care and uh, additional ones, increasingly additional ones. Uh, imposed upon the hospitals by the healthcare insurance uh, companies, um, 
Increasingly, the medical specialists are de developing discipline-specific uh, indicator. And in the near future, the AMC, um, which goes for accreditation by the Joint Commission uh, International, now we'll come back to that later, will have to meet the JCI standards uh, of care, which were uh, already shown to you by Elizabeth. Thanks to these, all these developments, uh, the audit team's assessment will in future be entirely based on objective data, more so than is um, uh, possible at present. The, finally, the uh, authority of the auditing uh, committee of internal uh, of the sorry the the authority of the audit committee is extremely uh, important. And the committee is composed of uh, department chairs of key departments like uh, uh, internal medicine, uh, surgery, psychiatry, uh, pediatrics, and neurology, and um, one or two nurse managers. Initially, uh, confidentiality was guaranteed in order to ask full commitment of the department chair for this instrument. Uh, the report uh, after the audit was sent to the department chair only and it was to his or her discretion to share the results with the medical staff, the nurses, the upper management as he or she saw fit. Currently, there, um, this is no longer felt to be necessary and the report is also distributed um, to the board of directors. It is very important to emphasize that during the audit, both the interviewer and the interviewee should hold a mirror in which each can see his or her reflection. It is not an examination. Uh, I already mentioned the authority of the auditing committee, which is uh, instrumental. The approach of the, of the audit is very gentle, very uh, cautious to seek full commitment, commitment of the department chair, who will be informed about the process of the audit about three months prior to the audit. The audit team will prepare the audit uh, based partly on the key data and uh, documents provided by the department. The audit team is composed of a department chair, a, a chief of uh, uh, medical staff, and a head nurse. The auditors are trained by a one-day uh, external uh, training session, and the auditors must take part in at least two audits each year in order to keep up their skills. The audit includes um, interviews with um, the head of the department, with the medical staff, with the nurses, with residents, and with whatever professionals working on the department. And there is also a time slot for an interview with medical specialists of departments with whom the audities closely collaborate. Um, the doctors from the ICU, the anesthesiology or radiology, for instance, if general surgery is the focus uh, of an audit in order to assess, to evaluate it, interdisciplinary, um, patient, um, interdisciplinary team performance. And furthermore, there are ward and workstation inspections and uh, chart reviews. The set of um, audit topic Topics include the department goals, um, how well these goals are met uh, in an international and national context, the organization of patient care, uh, whether there is evidence-based practice, uh, the assessment of organization and performance by the medical staff and the nurses and other parties collaborating, collaborating with the department's medical specialists. And of course, patient experiences are a crucial part of the evaluation. Um, let me give you uh, one example. You, the, all the uh, uh, items which are addressed uh, with regard to uh, patient safety are listed here uh, on the slide. I would specific, specifically mention uh, risk assessment. 
a couple of months ago, there was a publication in the New Eng uh, England Journal of Medicine on uh, a surpass model, which is a pre-operative -screen, pre screening instrument, and that was developed by a group of surgeons uh, in our uh, hospital. Um, it's web-based and now uh, is implemented in uh, 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 under the auspices of the uh, inspectorate of health care in all the hospitals uh, of the Netherlands. But also risk assessment, uh, of course, uh, implies assessment of medication, uh, pressure ul ulcers, falls, allergy, um, etc., etc. The, the audit lasts for a single working day and will be concluded by an oral presentation of the team's findings. The audit team is responsible uh, for the audit report, which will subsequently be discussed by and approved by the um, uh, internal audit committee. The audit will be presented to the department chair in person uh, within four weeks um, of the completion of the audit. And finally, a week after um, the uh, audit, uh, the performance of the audit and the results of the uh, team will be evaluated by the secretary um, to the internal audit committee. It's important to mention that the AMC's audit model is in line with the approach for qualitative uh, audits used by the Dutch medical specialists uh, societies um, uh, since uh, uh, the end of the 80s of the previous century. The international uh, program used by the European uh, Foundation for Quality Management and um, by the Netherlands Institute for Accreditation of Hospitals, the NIAS. This means that participating in other types of audits will not entail unnecessary and extra work. In short, uh, the internal audit is a form of peer review by professionals, obviously, and for professionals. It's a look in the mirror rather than a uh, addressing shortcomings. It's very important to realize that it's a learning experience, it focuses on patient care and it has a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Um, the audit report, uh, I mentioned it before, includes um, the findings and recommendations by the audit team. The department chair is requested to deliver an improvement plan and if the recommendation is conditional because um, the patient or uh, staff safety is at stake. The improvement should be implemented within three months. Um, we performed a survey uh, amongst the department chairs after the first cycle of audits had been uh, completed. And all bar one participated in that um, a survey. Um, and we were delighted um, to notice that uh, there was virtually anonymous um, enthusiasm about this um, model of peer review uh, and about the conducted, conducted uh, audit. Uh, internal auditing was considered a very important tool to improve um, patient care. And with regard to the recommendations, in almost 90% they were followed by uh, improvement actions. So um, we asked the department chairs uh, about the crucial elements uh, in the audit. And they mentioned the initial confidentiality of the report, the participation of the nursing staff, the indisputable authority of the internal audit committee, and the limited amount of time that had to be uh, devoted to the uh, uh, audit. The learning experience of an audit is primarily ex experienced, as I said, by the department chair, uh, the department staff, and the auditors. Um, the audit leads to a greater awareness of organizational responsibility, also called ownership, more attention for the relevance of the patient's pers pers uh, perspective, an increase uh, in the perceived need uh, for the development of performance indicators, and as I heard yesterday, most importantly, a will to really improve patient care. 
In conclusion, um, we are on the threshold of a major paradigm shift. Uh, however, still much work lies ahead of us before we can be satisfied that peer review is making its full contribution to the quality of uh, patient care and uh, patient safety. And in this regard, I should like to refer again to Ed, uh, Edwards, who claims that a non-punitive peer review process uh, infused with uh, quality improvement uh, principles appears to be more uh, effective than the traditional quality assurance model. The current situation um, is that uh, we have completed now our second cycle uh, of audits, that the report is also forwarded to the Board of Directions. And I already mentioned the JCI. Um, our governing board uh, has applied for JCI accreditation in 2012, and that requires um, the use of the JCI standard as reference and adjustment of our cycles from four years to three years. Um, to go for JCI accreditation is uh, indeed very uh, ambitious. It means that the committee has to expand and has to be transformed to a committee of quality and uh, safety. Uh, the committee will collect all sorts of data in addition to the data on its own patient-centered uh, internal uh, audit. So the committee will have a, a bird's eyes view and will, of course, uh, also um, have to take into account the JCI elements uh, like um, the aspects uh, like um, patient safety, uh, staff quality, qualifications, education, and um, governance, leadership, and direction. My penultimate Careful, watch your step, uh, slide right. shows you Vinny Capaziello, 48-year-old man, experienced acute onset well crushing substernal chest pain, shortness of breath, BP's 50 pal, breast 28, O2's at 10 liters, saline's wide open. Whoa, whoa, he's sweating. Diaphoretic. You feeling any pain now, Mr. Capaziello? Oh, uh, yeah. The band, Carter? He's in cardiogenic shock. I'm in two. I'll be right in. No, I'll get it. Uh, sure. Great. Ellis West, visiting attending. Carter, is it? Uh-huh. Who do we have? MI, hypertensive and cyanotic. Okay. All right. I can assure you that these, um, that this hospital would certainly have failed the JCI test because they wear unbuttoned coats, they have their stethoscope around their neck, and their ties are flying around. <laughs> What a contrast with the surgeons of the academic medical centers. Don't they look neat in their buttoned up white coats? And they all show their name tags and you can hear them virtually shout JCI, here we come. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, thank you very much for the invitation and the, pro the possibility to speak here to you about how to empower professionals in healthcare to improve. And this will be how, on the human scale, we are facing the possibility of how we come to handle the professionals, how difficult it is to learn them and to go with them in the AMC. I am myself as I'm a psychiatrist and I'm working uh, as a professor in guideline development and quality assurance for already uh, 10 to 15 years. And this is Martin Luther. Uh, some of you will know him, most of you will not know him, but this is a monk who was responsible for the European Christian reform movement that established the Protestantism in the Netherlands. And uh, this man is a very important improvement. Tried to do that for the Catholic Church, but he didn't succeed. He, he did succeed, but there was a division between the Catholic Church and the Protestantism. In a letter, he was asked what he should do if he would die tomorrow. And his answer was, I will plant a tree tomorrow. That's an important answer, so to speak. I wanted to plant a tree today, a strong evidence-based lecture to you that will be, you will remember for years 
about how to empower professionals in healthcare to improve. Of course, that is quite impossible and an illusion of grandeur. In the, in, the, in the lecture of Atul Gawanda, he talked about the value of humility because we as humans are li liable to error. We as humans need evidence-based medicine because we suffer from bias, confounding. We show reactance, an emotional reaction to pressure or persuasion that results in the strengthening or adoption of a contrary belief. We suffer from selective perceptions, acceptations influence perceptions, and the cognitive dissonance and uncomfortable feeling caused by holding conflicting ideas simultaneously. The theory of cognitive dis dissonance proposals that people have a motivational drive to, re to reduce this dissonance. They do this by changing their attitudes, beliefs and actions. Dissonance is also reduced by justifying, blaming and denying. It is one of the most influential and extensively studied theories in social psychology. We can also be influenced very easily. We buy things we don't need and are sensitive for advertisements. Continual improvement and quality insurance needs to address psychology. That is very important. It's also important for animals. The fox and the grapes by Aesop. When the fox failed to reach the grapes, he decided he doesn't want the grapes after all. That's an example of adaptive preference formation designed to reduce cognitive dissonance. Also with the animals, it's there. Human beings are um, people that can do different things. And I will go on with this. I will remove this one. And Antul, uh, uh, Atul Kowanda inspired me, he showed me and told us, told us his, in his inspiring lecture on Wednesday that humility is an important virtue. We can and do fail as doctors and nurses. We are humans and are limited in our capacities. And he told the story of a patient who recovered after a severe trauma because of wonderful teamwork of committed doctors and nurses. They only forget the man to tell that the, he, uh, his, ple his spleen was removed, that he had to take certain medications. And after a sever severe pneumonia and a sepsis, he lost all his fingers and toes, toes. And we have to pursue perfection, as Don Warwick prepared uh, his, this, uh, said this a few years ago. And in preparing this talk, I remembered that I had a picture in my file made by a nurse. I can't find the source because it is anonymous. Of a tree. And the tree is well designed metaphor for healthcare improvement. And the tree shows us that, for example, leaderships and clinical inquiry by the ACI, for example, is an important. The evidence-based ground and clinical research is here. Education, it is very difficult to teach smart people to learn. It's a very nice article of Arthur Robertson in the Harvard Business Review. And also leading uh, uh, clever people is a new article in the Harvard Business Reviews. And you see a cloud there, a lack of confidence, a lack of autonomy, a lack of time, a lack of motivation, a lack of access. And in the tree, you see clinical thinking, professional growth, and so on and so on. The very nice metaphor of improving quality care, especially the clinical inquiry I will focus on. So I will focus on the professionals of improving healthcare. So again, how to empower professionals to improve healthcare. And we are going from an internal auditing system with Marianne told you to a YCI hospital accreditation in 2012. In the academic medical hospital, for years we have this system of internal auditum, auditing, and we are going to change it to the YCI. I was for years a member of a board of the Dutch National Institute for Accreditation called NIAS in healthcare. And we find it very difficult to uh, involve staff in the accreditation process. 
The Dutch Association of Medical Specialists had, was in the board, but the accreditation for the care itself was not for the NIAS, but for the medical specialists themselves by peer review called quality of the medical technical performance by medical audits. So the medical uh, uh, procedures were not in the accreditation process. Since the 80s, all parties, including the government, accepted the plan of the Dutch Association of Medical Specialists for a national program for peer review among specialists. Peer review was considered as a domain of self-regulations. Visitations of the medical practice organized by peers in, outside, in and outside the hospitals is also done by the medical specialists themselves. These activities were started by scientific associations voluntarily since the beginning of the 90s. The government is financing this and more to stimulate this form of self-regulation. The NIAS is now involving in an indirect manner the medical and technical performance. Of course, it is a valuable way of accreditation by peer review, but it is in conflict with the custom in the democratic countries to separate powers, known as the trias of Montesquieu, who was a political philosopher in the Enlightenment, and Montesquieu saw that the various forms of government were preserved for corruption. He saw despotism and argued that this could be prevented by a system in which the different bodies exercise legislative, executive and judicial power. Doctors make their own laws, exude them and control themselves. And this could be a, con and, 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 and a source for conflicts. In my view now, the splitting, I was in the board of that uh, NIAS, of organizational and medical performance was a crucial mistake. That another body helps to execute the power would be wiser, like ECI. The ECI uh, sets a standards of 300 norms and uh, 1300 criteria for quality of care and patient safety. And uh, it gives trust and low tolerance. It's only once in three years the hospital is looking at its performance and you can lose your accreditation if you do not good. The ACI let the hospital be inspected by peer auditing, training the ACI during daily practice. The ACI inspectors come irregularly unexpected and once in several years to the control, but can also be two days after you have the seal. Most important is what happened to the individual patient and everybody around and involved with that. During diagnostics, treatment and care for outpatient to postage yards after an admission. So the surpass method Marianne told you about is very with the GCI standards. This patient focus is primarily by patient traces, but also system traces, for example, building and infrastructure safety, fire safety, and so on. Not a professional, but the process in the focus of attention is more quality improvement in a patient tracer. By asking the professional, tell me, show me, where it's written down, and we have some discussions with everybody about why the standard is there, why we have to wash our hands in the psychiatric department. I can tell you why that is. And we have proved that it is important to do that because we're going to down with infections. Much attention is given to safety issue, compare the findings to the standards and criteria after all, and then improvement proposal are done by the department. You see that then it's the standardization also, the norms of the ECR are improving all the time. That's why it's costly, because ECI looks at all the literature in the world and tries to make new standards, so he had a quality improvement system. You remember, most of you will see that, but the purple thing here is the standardization, and that goes up all the time. Ongoing uh, internal audit system is merged together with the ACI accreditation and once in the three years and the tracers are added. And the EMC was prepared for at least five to ten years for this to do the ECI. And we are the first hospital in the Netherlands to do the ECI, but another one in Utrecht is also starting with it. What motivates our professionals in the hospital and the EMC, I think? a non-punitive peer review process. Marianne told you already about it. Cultural organization and client factors. The, the, the culture of quality assessment, weeding out the bad apples, for example, 
I give an example of that, obligated swimming as a part of a curriculum with known results, because if I ask you today, we're going to run for outside and see, I can tell you already what will be the result of running. One will be the best, and one will be the worst, but what, 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 what will we do without it? Competitive swimming and individual improvement, if everybody swims a little bit harder, that's Olympic spirit and that is quality improvement in our hospital. And we are building on an academic tradition of evaluating and improving for the last 20 years evidence-based medicine and good conduct. And we have a strong focus on patient values. We have black numbers. That means we have a financial system in the hospital, but it's good. Although we have to cut down costs, still we have black numbers. And the professionals in the lead means that the professionals are in the lead. So we have 7,000 people who work as a quality person. We don't have five or 10, but we have 7,000. We have 7,000 professionals and they're always in the lead. Of course, there's a hierarchical structure. Yeah? And for example, we have programs like Suppose It Is Your Mother campaigns and Patients Manifestos. <coughs> this patient manifestos we give to the patients and tell them the, that what they can expect in the hospital. And you see the, the picture of the mother helping the mother is a mother project. For example, yeah. waiting time for the outpatient department is 20 minutes. We'll try to combine your appointments. You have a right on information about your disease and the treatment and its alternatives. And how was that developed? A mother group studied patient complaints, mirrors meetings, measurements, and patient laws, discussed in a long series of seminars with all personnel and all heads of the department, approved by the board of the directors, and checked by the internal audit system. But how do professionals think about quality improvement? If you see this picture, and you study the picture, you will see that the thinking is different than standardized, use checklist, and the work as a team. Professionals don't think so. They think that they don't have time enough, they have more time, they have to com communicate better, and uh, if they are very nice doctors and the technical aspect is good, then we have good quality. That is wrong. It's totally wrong. It doesn't work like that. What motivates professionals to engage in the accreditation of healthcare organizations? There was a qualitative study on worker motivation and healthcare accreditation in Australia with 30 uh, reviews. And there's a theory and there are results I will show you. Highly motivated professionals improve the internal efficiency of your organization. They are more willing to improve, they are less stressed, they have a better job satisfaction, they are more engaged in the organization, and they are willingness and prosper and promote change. And higher motivation depends on the participation and autonomy in the workspace, an individual status and role, you are something in the hospital, altruistic capital, people want to do something for a good service, personal relations, and clear professional norms, guidelines, and attitude and standards. And we have for years, we have all kinds of uh, improvements, uh, things in the hospital like uh, guidelines and so on. But this is a very important thing because this uh, um, uh, GCI, for example, gives us now more exact what we have to do to improve safety and quality. I will not go into detail in this, but this, the, the study you have to read is very interesting what people comment on it. And they, for example, the accreditation response, uh, some people, uh, you have to discuss that because they said it's, it, it's time in consuming and we, we can do it, it is too much work, and uh, uh, it's, it is managerial respons responsibility and high cost. And if you discuss that, uh, you will see that you can uh, improve that kind of opinions. And they developed a model that participation, reflection on practice, learning and working and teamwork, gives benefits of 
collaborative learnings, champions on quality and safety, breakdowns of silos of departments, promotes collaborative care and safety culture, and motivates to learn and make improvement quality of care. And those things reinforce each other. That's very nice to see. And the last slide of Marion, where we see the surgeons in our hospital, together with the, the badge and the sleeves upside down and no ties anymore, is one of the examples how that works. Now I'll go to finish. Values and moral reflections like discipline, standardized, what can be standardized, less variations and checklists are the new quality principles. We have to do it in a team because healthcare is very complex. We have 13,600 diagnoses, 6,000 medicines, numerous procedures, and 15% of the patients have 50% of the cost, and most of the patients have multiple conditions. And Atul Kowanda told us that we are fooled by penicillin because one injection does it all, and that doesn't work in healthcare anymore. And what he told us, we need humility. We can do and we can and do fail as we humans are, are limited in our capacity, and that's what I told you already by the three years of Montesquieu. We know sins and virtues, and I know this is a very conservative approach, and I won't go into detail, but I want to show you two things. The greed and charity are uh, sins we can, uh, and, and, and a virtue uh, we can all uh, suffer from. And greed, uh, if you can earn money out of patient care, for example, is a difficult thing to do. Vanity and humility, you see the difference on this picture, is very important because the concept of humility addressing intrinsic self-worth self -worth, is emphasized in the realm of religious practice and ethics where the, emotion, the notion is often made more precise and extensive. And the recent research suggests that humility is a quality of certain type of leaders. For example, Jim Collins, he told this morning, and his colleagues found that a certain type of leader, for whom they turn level five, possesses humility and fierce, re and fierce resolve. Humility is being studied as a trait that can enhance leadership effectiveness. The research suggests that humility is a multidimensional and includes self-understanding and awareness, openness and perspective talking and not the finger. Because we are very, we get the reactance of the finger. We don't like the finger. So, some take, take home messages. Trust is better than control, but without control, my students don't study. And doctors, and doctors and nurses can make mistakes. We need checklists, discipline, and teamwork. Professionals, as humans in the complex healthcare, need an external control. And empowerment by doing peer review with clear norms and, st and standards is important. And last but not least, be aware of greed and vanity. Okay, thank you for listening. Well, I think an another um, terrific presentation and just the, the sheer amount of, you know, kind of discipline and, and leadership that has um, g gone into that um, process, I think is phenomenal. And, and one thing that I take from that presentation, you know, one way I think about it is, is commitment versus compliance. Because, of course, we want people to, um, to comply. But actually, if we build it on a basis of commitment, the compliance is so much easier. And I think that was a, a wonderful case study. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So, um, but I hope that Jan and Marianne will stay as long with Elizabeth. So if we kind of put them at the front here, then you know, do come and have some conversations. Um, I hope that there are some evaluation forms. And if you could fill one in, um, it, it, it really helps in terms of um, planning next year. Then the other thing to say is at 12.15, there is the special session on Afghanistan in the main auditorium. And I would really um, you know, urge you to go and um, pick up your lunchbox and have your lunch later um, and, and go to the Afghan um, session. And um, so I hope that you enjoy the rest of today and, um, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for our session. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.